federal deals that benefit individual countries, 24%, 26%, and then greater cooperation, but only bilaterally, 21%, and less cooperation, it's a zero-sum game, 10%. Very interesting. All right, well, thank you, all of you. We're going to come back to you because this is an interactive session, so we're delighted that you gave us your answers. So, Cecilia, let's go to you first. So, what's your definition? How do you, would you characterize uh, the global trade environment today? Um, and where do you see it heading? And do you agree with the uh, polling results here? Well, they were kind of contradictory, no? <laughs> At least the second question. Well, I, I think we have two trends in the, in the global uh, trading system. On the one hand, we do have uh, threats. We have increased protectionism. We have the threat of trade wars between at least two big countries. We have um, countries who are acting um, on their own, disregarding global rules and, and undermining the global trading system as it is defined. We have, and I'm sure Roberto will talk more about that, we have a profound crisis in the WTO, the multilateral trading system that has served us so well and still serves us well. Uh, it's a crisis, but I think it can be mended. So that is on the negative side. On the other hand, we have a sort of contra-reaction to that, which I think was partly expressed in, in the poll, because also a lot of countries saying that, well, trade is actually a good thing. Trade wars are not good. They are not easy to win. And uh, trade can be mutually beneficial. So let's do good trade. And that's what we see that the world is sort of engaging more and more in regional and bilateral trade agreements. We saw the TPP countries after the US withdraw that they went ahead. And then there is also a lot of trade agreements be between uh, other countries as well. From the European Union side, we have an extremely ambitious trade agenda. Um, we, we have an, uh, agreements with, with Canada. We, the Japan agreement is entering into force next week, which is the biggest trade agreement ever made between two partners. Uh, we have uh, trade agreements done and soon to be, be, be voted in Parliament with Mexico, uh, with uh, Singapore, with Vietnam. We are negotiating with Mercosur, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, Tunisia, and a few others. Um, and that's really good. because, And we do that you know, in a mutual beneficial, sustainable, open, transparent way. And we've also tried to engage very much, uh, and I guess we'll come to this later in the debate, with, with the citizens to make sure that we also have the trust that is and was not there, making them more transparent, making them also inclusive when it comes to listen to the advice of, of different stakeholders, not only business, business of course, uh, making sure that they include chapters on sustainable development and, and um, reference to international conventions and so on. And th that, so th that, that's a positive trend. And with all these countries, we're also working to reform, strengthen and modernize the WTO. So in other words, you see that as was respo the response in the first poll, that multilateralism is still very important Absolutely. in this arena, yeah. but as was indicated in the second poll, that also that there are other avenues, mm. be it regional uh, uh, associations as well as bilateral deals. But they don't have to be in contradiction. Right. You can be you know, a profound believer in the multilateral system, mm -hmm. and then, because it's not enough, you will do bilateral or regional agreements, but found it in the multilateral rules system. So that's not a contradiction. The, the contradiction was the last question that, well, you know, you, basically it's not a good thing. We, we should only see what's, what's good for us. Uh, but but th there are different trends here. All right. Uh, Ming Po, let's go to you. Let's get your reaction to the poll results. Uh, how did you see it? And also, I want to get in the mix another a question. You know that you have a number of economies that are refocusing to become more national. Yeah. And as they become more national, what is the impact of that on, on, on businesses, basically? Um, can interests converge with greater openness and transparency still, even as they become more national? But first, give us your reaction to the, uh, the poll results. Yeah, I'm not surprised that, that uh, uh, because there is the reality, political reality and uh, business reality. Actually, I'm the open up uh, policy uh, China. I'm one of the typical globalization of products because I was uh, uh, born in a very small town in China and I come to France 30 years ago and I founded Cafe Capital 12 years ago and I live in New York. So what I see in the ground uh, the political reality and the business reality is different because the company, the entrepreneurs, 
uh, should be global. It's by nature, because your consumers are global and your competitors are international. So I'm not surprised that, that uh, the people still believe the globalization is, uh, is still uh, the way and uh, to collaborate. Uh, sometimes people think the globalization and the global partnership, it is a zero-sum zero -sum game. Mm. But it could be a win-win exactly. uh, situation. Uh, I'm an investor crossing China, Europe, in the US. I think I'm the only Chinese who speak English with a such strong French accent. <laughs> <laughs> I only invested into a series, you know, uh, in your pocket, all the Euro uh, bank note. Uh, the technology of hologram come from series. They want to go to Chinese market since no, but since we become shareholder, I can tell you in a pocket all the Chinese passport. They are the technology of hologram come from series, a French, SME company. We are shareholder of Ecosense. It is a, a, a leaf a disease a diagnostic a, a machine. Uh, they want to go to China, but we are shareholder of Meilian. We own about 300 uh, uh, clinic in China. And uh, immediately we use this same technology, French company, for Chinese population. And there's some in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the same way, uh, Chinese company Kabiu, they are in the infant powered additive. They just acquire uh, a company to better serve the local market in Australia. You know, those kind of examples, we can see if sometimes you need to set up a local factory in China or some, somewhere else. It's not necessary to Detroit your domestic jobs. Sometimes it creates the R&D jobs. Mm. So in a young generation of entrepreneurs, in particular in the innovation space, by construction, they are already international, global. And in their mindset, they are obsession. How to satisfy the unfulfilled demand? Where it is consumers? Where is competitors? The collaboration is really not a zero, zero sum game. And so it is so you, so you would say that even though there is this, uh, if one uses the term, a kind of uh, greater emphasis on nationalism in some quarters, that nevertheless that uh, is there are political. these interests that yeah. converge and yeah. there is this kind of inclusivity and openness. That's what exactly. I'm hearing you say. Exactly, exactly. All right. Roberto, the WTO is very much at the center of this game. <laughs> and tell us, I mean, your views on, you know, where is the WTO headed? How are, you, how are you addressing these challenges? You've had challenges, certainly in the past, at times with rules and countries abiding by rules. But, you know, going forward, what are the challenges that you're seeing? Well, but I, I believe, first of all, that the challenges are bigger than ever before. I mean, let alone the WTO, if you think about the multilateral trading system, which was created after the Second World War, 1947, <laughs> until today, we never had challenges this big. I mean, the challenges to the system are really fundamental. Um, and my view, and I, I would agree entirely with the first question uh, response about the, is multilateralism viable? I think it is. I absolutely believe it is. Um, We're working to make it even more viable. Now, I don't think that a stagnant multilateral system is viable. It has to evolve. It has to be transforming itself. It has to be changing, adapting, responding to the global reality, to a world that is changing faster than it ever did before. Now, that was not happening. That clearly was not happening. We managed to deliver uh, some pretty important uh, outcomes recently, the Trade Facilitation Agreement, the Information Technology, uh, Information Technology Agreement. We eliminated agricultural export subsidies. That came, they, those are unprecedented agreements, but that's, although they're good, they're big, they're important, they're not enough. It's unacceptable that an organization like the WTO in 2018 was not talking about electronic commerce, was not talking about the digital economy. Uh, it's unacceptable. It's, it's the core of global evolution today. So. That's why uh, the reform conversation began, and I think the G20 leaders in Buenos Aires made this point. The system 
is important. It is important to create jobs. It is important to create economic growth. But it needs to be updated. It needs to be modernized. And I think that's the challenge that we have now. Is that, is that your biggest challenge that you would define as, as that updating? Is that what I'm hearing? I think, I think either the system is updated or it will either lose relevance or disappear. It will be supplanted by other mechanisms that will come up. And that, I think, is a challenge for the global community. This is not a challenge for the WTO. The WTO and the global you know, uh, trading system is out of the picture. We're in for the dark ages. I guarantee you that. And um, I think it's a challenge, not for us, not for the WTO. It's a challenge for the whole global economic community. Well, let me ask you one more. What's the best way forward to achieve that? In your I opinion? think it's to engage, it's to give solutions, it's to try to do something. And frankly, I have a lot of people here from the private sector. It is not enough to cross your fingers and hope that things will work out for the best. No. You have to participate in this conversation. You have to figure out what is happening in Geneva, and there is a lot happening in Geneva right now that affects you, and which are the outcomes that you want to see from this conversation. Talk to your governments, talk to other companies, talk to companies from other countries, not only the ones that you, know, you agree automatically with, but talk to your competitors. Talk to people who are not your automatic, you know, uh, uh, people who think like you, but who also want to have positive results that uh, give clarity and predictability uh, to the trading system. All right. Christian, let's come to you. Uh, what's the impact here on the business uh, community? Um, you know, you sit where you sit. Uh, in terms of the flow of uh, global trade, in terms of where it's headed and what the challenges that, the challenges that have been before uh, trade, how does that impact business? What well, are it's, your uh, it's, these it's days? Uh, impacting business significantly. But before I come to that, I, I would like you to go to back to, <laughs> yeah, to, to the first question because, on the one hand, I'm really glad about a 100%, though 100% is always a bit uh, <laughs> awkward, right? So, <laughs> the key issue I see with the 100% is if you ask the same question in the normal population, you wouldn't get 100%. And that's to your point. We have mm -hmm. to far better bring our messages while global trade is important to the people who don't understand why it is important. We don't have yet, I don't know how, the, uh, how, the, how this question would turn out if you ask the population in the street, but I guarantee you it would be less than 80%, it would be less than 70%. And I think our job is not only to update the system, but also to explain the people what the advantage of global trade is, because we have, in my view, not a trade crisis, we can fix that, but we have a confidence crisis in the global trade and people feel disadvantaged because of that. And hence, I think that is really key to learn from this question. In this room, everybody understands this. Everybody's well educated, a lot of private sector people, but we need to get the backing of the people in the society. Now, on the business, uh, to be honest, we notice that. Um, you know, if you, if you are the leading bank in Germany, 80% um, of the revenues of the DAX 30 companies is generated outside Germany. They depend on global trade. And we see that there is in certain sectors, and not only in those sectors which are always mentioned, be it the automotive, automotive supplier sector, there are certain declines. That is one issue which is uh, certainly already playing in, and we have seen it in the second half of 2018, and that is also one of the reasons why we have seen a little bit of the uncertainty in the capital markets in October, November, and December. People are waiting and seeing. The real problem about this whole question is that the kind of the perception of the problem, and that means the confidence is losing, and that means that a lot of business leaders are now re-evaluating their investments going forward. And that means they also delay investments. They are stopping investments. They wait for political solutions. And that is actually something which you don't yet see in the numbers, but which you will see. And hence, I think updating the system, coming to agreements, doing the mixture of multinational agreements, but also bilateral agreements, is so important to reinstall confidence. Because if the confidence is gone, then honestly, I would say we are heading uh, to the title of the session that global trade is at a tipping point. Last but not least, but let's also <coughs> not leave Davos, because I think last year at this point in time, people were almost too bullish about 2018. Now, when I talk to people, 
In my view, they are almost too cautious about 2019. <laughs> the fundamentals of the corporates and the fundamentals of the economy is still good. We have to use this momentum in order to now, exactly what you're saying, updating the system, we have to engage, and then I think, honestly, we have a fair chance to fare well. Are there opportunities for business then in this environment? That's what I'm hearing you say. Yes, they are. They are, and um, uh, actually, uh, it is it is exactly the opportunities which we heard before. We need to think about certain bilateral agreements. We should not obviously um, stop thinking about multinational uh, agreements. But as long as we step into these discussions, as long as we can make and convince the people what the advantages of global trade, honestly, then I don't think uh, that it will decline. Then we have a chance to do additional business. All right, great. And David, same question, the impact on business. And let me also give you the opportunity also to respond to the poll. Everyone here has, <clears throat> has done so. But what do you see uh, as the opportunities for business and the impact on business um, uh, as a result of where global trade is at this, at this point in time? All right, well, first, good morning, everyone. And uh, I always like this format because I feel like I need to be rotating around in order to see everyone. But uh, a lot of familiar faces in the room. So as soon as I saw the question, I assumed uh, at least 90% were going to be in favor of multilateral trading because just knowing the, the people in this room. And then I see one of the big proponents uh, uh, right to my left here, Ambassador Stu Eisenstadt. And... Uh, and I know how he feels about trade, but many of the other people uh, in this room. And, you know, the thing that I've noticed about uh, the last few days here is you can get in these rooms and you can talk about these challenges and it can start to build upon itself and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And so it starts to get cloudy and then you go outside and the sun's shining. And, uh, <laughs> And that's the way I feel about the situation. Now, there's a lot of progress that's been made. Are there headwinds? Absolutely, there are headwinds. But, uh, but uh, this morning, before we came in here, we were talking among the speakers, and I recognize Commissioner Maelstrom as a, as a trade superstar this year for these deals that she's been able to, to negotiate. And... Uh, uh, you think about prior years and, and look at the, the number of deals that either have been ratified or the one that's been ratified next week uh, with Japan or, or the others. There's a lot of good news there. Uh, with NAFTA, there was some apprehension. There was some concern, right? If NAFTA had been terminated, it would have had a big, big effect. There's no doubt about that. But we did reach an agreement, and I believe that this agreement can get ratified throughout the three countries. That's another step. Would we have liked for it to have been less pain? <coughs> Absolutely, you know. But we've got the agreement, or, or should have the agreement, that uh, once it gets ratified. So there again is, is another. So not in denial, but when I talk to it, we connect millions of, uh, of businesses throughout the, the world, right? And... Uh, and when I'm talking to these CEOs, including this week, uh, there's a lot of them that see opportunities. You know, Now, they're worried about headwinds with the U.S.-China. They're worried about headwinds with Brexit. But there's so many opportunities. And the reason I think there's so many opportunities is e-commerce. E-commerce is growing tremendously. Mm -hmm. E-commerce is going to find a way to connect the world, whether we get these trade agreements right or not. I mean, it's just... It's an overwhelming force that's going to continue. Now, we can help that a lot uh, with these different agreements. I couldn't have been in any more agreement with what you said, that we've got to have a global e-commerce agreement now, along the lines of the trade facilitation agreement, which, you know, I told you last year, I thought that you were the trade superstar last year because... <laughs> Get that, that trade facilitation agreement was so important. It's a good start. And now we need to get this next one. And to hear you say it right off the bat, I'm wanting to clap for you because <laughs> it's just so important to the world. But uh, 
We've got to get past some of these headwinds, but I'm telling you, there's still lots of opportunities out there. But it's going to happen. Go. The e right. Actually, this is one of the good news with, with WTO uh, because the, the huge frustration that e-commerce is not on the agenda led to some countries coming together and saying, okay, let's see if we can move forward on a plurilateral, full agreement with the WTO rules and transparency and openness and come together. And that work has been led by Australia, Singapore and Japan. And tomorrow there will be a, a decision by 66 countries to launch these negotiations. And these are, you know, rich and poor, a variety of countries. And we hope that others will join. Uh, and that would be a plurilateral. Uh, and and the, the, the first negotiation round is already scheduled for March. So, so it is happening. Uh, and and that, that is good news. It shows that it's still live in, in the multilateral uh, system, even if this is a little sidestep. But, but, and there are other discussions ongoing uh, as well. So Christian, it, it, it might happen. You're shaking your head. You want to jump in on this, uh, on this particular point? No, I'm not point? shaking. I'm, no, no, no. I'm shaking your head <laughs> in agreement. No, in agreement. no, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm completely in agreement. Um, I, I think this is uh, uh, exactly the right point. Um, but if we talk about, I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful, if we talk about e-commerce, if we talk about the whole digital world, yeah. then um, you know what, it brings up a completely different topic because, you know, my home country is always criticized for having the biggest uh, account surplus, which is true. And, and we can honestly, we can attack it, we could do more investments also domestically and we need certain investments domestically. But what nobody is talking about is actually the digital deficit Germany is running with the rest of the world, in particular also with the US. Mm. So I think when we talk about trade, when we talk about deficit and surplus and who is wrong and who is right, then let's always also talk about a level playing field and let's include everything. And then I think we also have different numbers because the, the uh, digital deficit Germany is running um, compared to the US is 30 billion uh, euros yeah. a year, which is huge. Mm. If you net this one, actually with our account surplus, we are talking completely different numbers. And that's what I mean. I think we have to engage, we have to make numbers transparent, and then come with the politicians and the business leaders to agreement. And then honestly, I think the door is open um, for further trade. All right, well, thank you for that. Let's go to the audience uh, now uh, and uh, take some uh, questions from uh, our audience. Uh, we would welcome it. We have a number of people here who uh, definitely are very immersed in uh, trade. Do I have to call on people? Yes, sir. Yes, and do you mind, use the mic, and if yes. you'll introduce yourself. Uh, Ken Goldman. Um, Thank you. You know, we actually, no one's really talked about, you know, from my perspective, what really gets in the way of trade. And, you know, when I think about it, and I'm, I'm going to keep this totally non-political, but, you know, when I think about how do you make things equal, equal across equality, uh, across the board relative to tariffs and other non-tariff aspects, and has that not been, I mean, we, could all, we can all talk about, uh, which I've all heard everyone here say, it's so great to have trade and all this stuff, multilateral and so forth, but no one's really talked about what really gets in the way of free trade and so forth, and, and reality is, trade has not been equal across the various countries. All right, let's- I'll make that premise. All right, let's take that question, and then we'll go to you, sir, if you want to pass the mic behind you. But uh, who would like to take that uh, question on? Well, there are, from our perspective, there are a number of things that can get in the way of trade. I think one clear uh, uh, development in, in today's world is that if we went back to the fall of the wall, back to 1989, nobody was challenging trade. Nobody was challenging the positive effects of trade in the economy. Um, today, because of the structural changes that you see, it's in certain economies, in certain countries, um, you're beginning to see questions about the disruptive effects of trade and a more nationalistic approach. Um, it, it's not across the board because people confuse things. Sometimes they say, well, there are many nationalist tendencies coming in different countries, etc." But their, their posture regarding trade is different. It's not uniform. If you look at the U.S., it's one thing. If you look at England, it's another thing. If you look at, um, I don't know, Mexico, Brazil, and other Country, it, it, there are different ways that they see trade. What I think we have now is a disconnect between the political cycle and the economic cycle. Uh, you have a political cycle of two, three years. For a politician, the disruptive effect of trade, the way that is easier for him to communicate to the elector, to the, to the voter, 
is to say, I am stopping imports, or I am uh, protecting this sector more than, 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 than previous governments did. And that's an easy fix. You find a, a foreign problem and you blame it on that, when in fact, the real problem is domestic. Yes. The real problem is domestic. If somebody lost his job with trade, fine. Three other people got new jobs because of trade, but they're not concentrating on the net two gains. Oh, no. They're concentrating on the one that lost the job. And that's very vocal. Uh, so the government has to be undertaking uh, educational uh, programs, uh, skilling programs, uh, training people, and frankly, some social security net to help those who are dislocated and then find a position for them somewhere down the road. Now, this is a too complex a conversation for the voter, right? So it's much easier to say, well, trade is a problem, let's fix that and that's it. So I think we have to have a, a stronger and more deeper conversation about the real causes of the disruptions and the benefits of trade, which is something that you were saying just a moment ago. We have a duty to inform yes. people about the real uh, benefits and consequences of trading. Ming Po, you wanted to make a comment. Yeah. And then we have, by the way, we have four other questions from the audience. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I echo what Christian said. We should really get the right education. Come back to the fundamental common sense. What it means trade? Okay, the trust, even within a country, the trade sometimes is not equal. Look, uh, in China, everyone knows Alibaba, JD.com. But three years ago, they are people who just born from Norway. And today, they are one of the key, second biggest e-commerce platform in China, founded by very young entrepreneurs. They are taking care of the countryside people. I come from my village, I have eight brothers and sisters. I'm number seven. My brother and sister never used e-commerce mm -hmm. before Pingdodo because we use uh, 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 we, uh, we chat uh, uh, environment and we put people to purchase together, you know? So even within country, but globally, I think the, the, the trust has come from sincerity. It's a question of surviving because I'm immigration everywhere I go, in France, in the US. So my obsession is what you want and what I can contribute, how, how I can help. If I treat you well, there's no reason you treat me uh, badly. So I think we should come back to maybe some fundamental common sense. I don't know how organization works, but I think the people, if you use the simple term and uh, come back to the human being, heart to heart, I think we can build a relationship as I have built in France because I have a French family, China Development Bank, but French sovereign fund, uh, European investment fund, all together in the same fund. Support Chinese company, French company, US company. Oh, Thank you. I Trust. Just, all right. just quickly, I know Trust. you want to move okay. to the next question, but uh, I do feel like I need to defend trade a little bit. And uh, now, has it been equal and has everybody benefited equally? The answer is no. And we've got to, that's one of the discussions of these additional trade uh, agreements and, uh, and a lot of discussion of how we need to educate uh, and reskill people for 21st century jobs. A lot of the jobs that have gone away are 20th century jobs. But the thing we cannot forget, and I thought that you were, were getting there too, is there are millions of people that are alive today because of these trade agreements and the progress that we have made since World War II. There are hundreds of millions that are living middle-class lives that would not be living those lives without the progress that we have made. So it is not a perfect system. There is no doubt about it. It is so much better than it would have been if we have not done these things. But now let's look at making it even better, right? And, uh, and I believe that we can. So it's a little quick commercial. Appreciate you letting me take the time to do that. Absolutely. Sir, you have the next question. And I'm going to suggest that after we hear your question, we also hear the next one, Ambassador Eisenstadt. And then we have two over here. Sir. Hi, I'm Jay from India. Um, I think uh, there's different perspectives. And if I look at the perspective of a, of a citizen of a country, you know, is he more concerned about his ability to earn or is he more concerned about his spending power in terms of less expensive goods and services that may come as a result of trade is one aspect. Second thing is, uh, you know, shipping things around the world uh, increases efficiency. 
but it also harms the environment. So what am I more concerned about as a citizen? And finally, you know, in a trade system, there's always going to be winners and losers between countries and also within countries. The question is how many of each? And is it actually increasing inequality or decreasing inequality? And if you don't mind, we're going to get that answer to your question. Can we pass the mic over here to Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt here? Oh, thank you. Thank I you. want to just uh, start with two negatives and then, uh, then positives playing on what each person has said. On the negative side, the multilateral system suffered a grievous blow when we were never able, after 10 years, uh, to reach a Doha round agreement. It really was the end of the broad 190 country effort. There's simply too many disparate interests to do that. But having said that, that does leave an opening for a whole range of bilateral, plurilateral uh, agreements that are consistent with WTO rules. And I applaud uh, Commissioner Malmstrom for leading the way. Uh, the second negative is when the president says that trade deals are bad, the deficits are negative, imposes unilateral tariffs on our allies as well as our competitors. Uh, it sets a very bad environment and reinforces the notion that trade is a zero-sum game and that somehow it's a negative for uh, workers. And that's where I think Mr. Hewing is so right that we've got to explain the benefits. But third, and here on the positive, and I, this is where I would come to Dave Abney, I think that there is a pulling back now from the negativity by the administration. We now have an improved U.S.-South Korea deal. We now have, as Dave Abney said, a NAFTA 2.0 agreement. It won't be easy to get through Congress, but I think we will. There's a pullback from the standoff with the EU on steel and at least the beginning of some effort at a bilateral agreement. And I believe that the pause that President Xi and President Trump <coughs> put on at the G20 with an agreement by May, uh, March 1, to try to reach an understanding that with all the differences that exist now, with the fact that there's no text exchanged, it's so much in the interests of both sides <coughs> that I think by March 1 there'll be a modest deal announced. Both sides need it. The president wants it for his re-election. So I think if you take a lot of the clouds away, and here, Dave, I come back to your more sunshine thing, I think without being unrealistically optimistic that we may see 2019 being a much more favorable trade environment than we've gone through in 2018. David, let's begin with you, maybe in responding not only to Ambassador Eisenstadt, but also to uh, our colleague from India, his, his points, because okay. he, he responded to you. <laughs> That's right. And I will partially and respond back around. because you have so many parts of your question. I'm not going to remember them all. So, uh, but uh, let's start with the consumer and what he or she may would, uh, would expect. And I think the first thing you have to look at is... Uh, the ability to buy and to purchase goods. And so that's jobs that I'm talking about. And, uh, and when you look, whether it's the United States or anywhere else, but in the U.S., 95% of the world's consumers are outside of the U.S. And with e-commerce, it is very possible. And we haven't talked about this yet, but it's extremely important. Small and mid-sized businesses run the economy throughout this world. And now with technology, this digital revolution, there is absolutely an opportunity for these small and mid-sized businesses to participate throughout the world. We have to get the agreements and do the things that will help, uh, help do that. But, but I think first is being able to look at the opportunities and that creates jobs. And, uh, and then yes, people are always gonna be interested in, uh, in the cost. But I can tell you that when you start putting tariffs on things all across the world, you're not doing anything to reduce cost. I mean, you're really not, right? You're driving costs, and sometimes you're driving costs to the very people that can least afford to pay it. And so we have to be very careful about that side of it, too. So, 
And we do have to have extensive training programs and making sure that, uh, that uh, the people have opportunities to participate. But we also, and, if, and this would be probably the only critical thing that I, that I will say about trade today, is we have to do a much better job of spreading the message of the benefits of trade. There are so many people yes. that can talk about the toxicity of it, right, and, and all the problems, but there are a lot of benefits. I don't think we've communicated that message as well as we've got to continue to do. All right. Uh, I, can, I, can I just make what, one statement? Sure. Because you go ahead I, and then I think Cecilia. your second point is a little bit like, like what we said before, that we have to far better communicate the, the benefits of trade. I think in particular if you talk to young people, trade versus the environmental mm -hmm. disadvantages, mm -hmm. that's something which we also have to pick up. And I believe if we can cast not only this story, but if we convince the people that trade overall is beneficial for the economy of this world, and that overall, on average, people will actually benefit from this. We also need certain agreements that part of this benefits is reinvested into environmental issues so that you connect these two. You cannot drive it separately. And therefore, I think you have a perfect point, but we can even link it to the benefits of trade if some of the benefits is reinvested, and that's what we need to do. So, so I wanted you to wanted comment on that as comment. well, because I also meet a lot of young people, and I think this, I mean, if, if you, global climate change is the issue that, that they bring up. Uh, and of course, trade has to pay, play its part uh, on that. And uh, I mean, you see different consumer patterns. In Europe, there is a more focus on, on local consumption on certain goods, which can be consumed locally, but there are diff obviously others that, that you can't. But trade can be a part of this. We were quite advanced in having an agreement on environmental goods within the, 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 the WTO. That is now paused, but I hope we can relaunch it. And the idea was to facilitate trade in technology that was good for the environment. They would take away tariffs and to facilitate that could be sewing systems or cleaning systems or, or, or what have you. Um, and we have, from our part, and I know that others have as well, in our trade agreements, quite ambitious that we want to work to protect the environment, we want to uphold certain international agreements, that we want to make sure that our trade is as green as, as possible. We we have, I mean, from trade agreements comes a lot of other uh, political cooperation, of course, in, in, in science to see how we can make transport more, more, uh, more uh, environmentally friendly. And, and that I think we, we have to invest on. But it doesn't mean automatically that trade is bad for, for, for the environment. And then just to Ambassador Eisenstadt, the Doha round failure is, of course, still with us. And we need when we talk about reforming the WTO, there's a lot to do. There's the process, there's the new issues, uh, there, there is how we work, there is trust. Um, the, the, but we need to see how we can break the deadlock from, from, from Doha, the development issues. We need to find a new method uh, to do that. And that is part, very much part of the discussions on reform that, that I'm involved in and many other countries uh, as well. We haven't found the way yet, but of course that can, we need to address new issues, e-commerce, but we cannot forget the old uh, issues like development issues in, in the Doha round, that, because that is key to gain the trust of all the members of WTO. Roberto and Ming Po, do, yeah. would you like to also respond? Uh, yeah, to very, quickly, very quickly. Very quickly. I think what Ambassador Eisenstadt I would conclude with is I, I would agree with his conclusion that uh, the environment for trade in 2019 is better than in 2018. Um, many challenges still, but I, I, I agree with that overall assessment. Um, but uh, going back to the question from our uh, Indian friend, um, I, f I think sometimes things catch, they're catchy. You know, for example, say a, an imported product uh, is damaging to the environment. That's, I don't have any evidence whatsoever in anything of the literature that I read that supports that. Quite the contrary. I, I've read many, many papers and studies that show that uh, traded products, in the, the products that actually find their ways into the trade flows, are usually much less harmful to the environment than the ones that are produced locally. Because they have to observe standards, they have to observe standards of the consuming country, of the country that is buying the products. They are usually produced with technology that is more sophisticated to make it into the global market technology that is less harmful to the environment. So this whole argument that there is an impact on the environment, I, I stand to be correct, but I haven't seen one single credible study that shows that. Um, on how many benefit, I think uh, David made the point, um, 
look, hundreds of millions of people recently have been brought out of poverty yeah. because of trade. And we made a, 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 a study in the WTO recently, what would mean, what would it mean to the world if all countries brought their, their tariff levels to the maximum that they have in the WTO standard. You know what would happen to global growth? It would be reduced by half. Half. Half of global growth would, poof, disappear. So that's the impact that you would have if you don't have trade in the equation. Is it the silver bullet that is solve all the evils? No, of course it doesn't. It has to be mixed with a bunch of uh, domestic policies that complement that. To, to be supportive of the effects of trade. But clearly, many more people benefit from trade than are harmed by trade. And finally, inequality. I saw a paper recently about inequality, that trade increases inequality. And I, was, and, and I asked the economist, I want to read that paper. But, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist. I studied some economy in college. I'm an engineer. I'm pretty good with numbers. I guarantee you that. And I was reading the paper. And the conclusion of the paper was that you know, the industries and the companies that traded, they paid better. Yeah. So their salaries would go up. <laughs> but I say, is that bad? That you're raising the income of those? Well, but, and then the economist was saying, but mathematically, it increases the inequality. And I said, yeah, but is that bad? I asked my question, what happened to the others that are not uh, trade related? Was, there, was their salaries uh, going down? They said, no, actually, they're going up, too. Mm, so? And I said, why? Because we said, well, because the guys who earn more, they spend more, they create the more dynamism in the economy. The other industries benefit, too. Not as much, but they all do. So I said, so let me ask you the question. So the question is, everybody's better off. Yeah, everybody's better off. But <laughs> mathematically, there's more inequality. Yeah, so trade is bad. I mean, uh, really, I, 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 I think that, that's the kind of thing that we don't have really yeah. to look so into these things in, in a more critical way. Any perception are right and a certain reason. So our work, the trading, I give you what you need, you give what I need. You are glass of water, I make you better, you make me better. You are glass of water, my glass of water, we mix together. I serve you exactly the same quantity of water, but it's no longer the same. In yours, they are mine, in mine, they are yours common interest. We have to explain to the population, trade is good, but how to do it? We have to probably make an emotion because the political reality and business reality, there is a gap and we have to bridge it. Through my personal example, I got together Chinese sovereign fund, French sovereign fund, European institutional families, other sectors, almost uh, one third of Cat Cajant, French Cajant are my Europeans. When they come to my uh, uh, investor meetings in China with uh, uh, the ambiance, people gather together. They just forget you are Chinese, you are French. Let me show you one anecdote. When I started my business in France, I sell granite. You know, before business, private equity. I founded the uh, granite business selling tombstone. I travel in every small town in France. Marbrier in France, they never seen any Chinese. <laughs> but I prohibit my salesmen pronounce continent, pronounce shipping, all those vocabulary. But just to show we do what we say. We are sincere. I, we bring something new. I can tell you we transform the industry and no one still considers me in France as Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're going to get three questions and we have to close with these three. You have a question, you have a question, sir, and she has a question. Uh, Please thank you. Uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. Nelson Cunningham <laughs> with McClarty Associates in Washington. I wanted to ask a question about the elephant missing from the room. And I mean that both as a tired metaphor and also maybe as a partisan descriptor. Uh, with the cancellation of the U.S. government's delegation here, Ambassador Lighthizer will not be joining you for the trade ministerial uh, that typically occurs on the margins of Davos. I wanted to ask both Director General Acevedo and Commissioner Malmstrom what the impact is of the absence of the elephant okay, on your we'll, meetings this weekend. We'll come to that, and that's directed to both of you. Sir, 
And if you'll introduce yourself. Hi, it's uh, Sean Don, and I write about trade for Bloomberg News. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the digital world a little bit and, and, and e-commerce and so on. Um, these talks, as, as you said, uh, Roberto, are, are coming uh, uh, maybe a few years later than they should have. I just wonder how worried you are about the world of digital protectionism. We talk about protectionism in terms of tariffs in the world today. We don't talk about uh, so much uh, digital services taxes or uh, the Great Firewall of China as, as, a, as a big uh, uh, protectionist uh, uh, barrier. Uh, and secondly, how worried are you about the, the digital world kind of cleaving into, into different spheres of influence? Uh, uh, certainly China has, uh, the digital world has operated behind a, a closed wall for, for many years and that has led to the, the rise of Alibaba and so on. Okay. And then over here. Uh, Heather Long from the Washington Post. I wanted to ask uh, the Commissioner Malmstrom how confident you are that the EU can avoid auto tariffs. Uh, <laughs> you know that I've heard a lot of sentiment this morning that 2019 is going to be better than 2018 for trade, but that auto tariff report is due in a month, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> In fact, when she arrived, she's been asked that question several times, and I've been standing near her. <laughs> you know, why don't we begin with you? Yes, that question and Brexit is the most uh, frequent <laughs> questions I get. But we didn't talk about Brexit. That is good. Uh, auto tariffs and lighthouse. Well, we, we don't know. We are following this very closely. We have made our position... Uh, perfectly clear from the European Union side. The European uh, uh, car business um, has made their opinion perfectly clear and I understand the Amer American car business as well. They don't want these tariffs because they are, uh, they are wrong in, in, you know, in, in substance and they will be bad for our economy and for the US economy and they're wrong in form. They will be, if they are imposed on us, they will be so under Section 232, which is uh, national security. So that is implying that the European Union is a national security threat to the European Union. We can never accept that. We are friends and allies, and we are not a national security threat. So we hope that this will not happen. In the agreement uh, signed by President Juncker and President Trump from July this summer, we try to find common ground where we're advancing. We have made some very important uh, progress there, and there's a process that, that, that is positive, I think. And it said also that we would not impose tariffs on each other on this. If that is violated by the US, we will have to respond. Uh, I don't want to do that, but we will have to do that. But we are confident that we will not be touched upon this. Um, uh, Ambassador's Lighthizer absence um, is unfortunate. I mean, it's all related to this shutdown uh, business and, and so on. Uh, of course, there will be someone representing the, the, the US there. I think the, the Geneva ambassador from the WTO. The discussion tomorrow among the trade ministers will focus on the reform of WTO. And one of the key issues there is the appellate body crisis. The appellate body, which is there as a second level to enforce the rules, which is key to all of us. It's important for the US. It's important for us and a number of other members, and that the, the, the US is blocking the appointment of the arbitrators there. This is one of the key issues where the whole membership wants to solve it. We have made some proposals and the US is still blocking. So the absence of a political level is, of course, unfortunate, um, but, but there will be someone there from, from the US. So we need to break that deadlock. Roberto, I think also the question posed by Sean was directed to you. Yeah, there were a couple. Digital there was a, a question about the elephant. Yes, uh, yeah. yes. the elephant as well. Right? And just the other day, somebody <laughs> asked me, what about the elephant? And I said, look, in trade, we have a herd of elephants. Exactly. <laughs> so you have to be more specific about which elephant you're talking about. But anyway, uh, I, I think um, it's, it's a pity they, they're not here, uh, but um, particularly because Davos offers also a possibility of many informal contacts and conversations by, at the margins of the meetings. And those often... Uh, are more productive and important <laughs> than the meetings themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, like Cecilia said, there will be somebody here making the case for the US. So I don't suppose that we're going to hear something earth shattering uh, in the meeting, uh, unfortunately, maybe. Uh, but uh, it's, it's natural that they're not. They're not, he they're not here because they don't like trade, and they're not here because they don't like the meeting. No. They're not here because they cannot be here. Uh, for whatever reasons. I mean, I, supposed to come. It's unfortunate, yeah. but it's, it's not going to be catastrophic, I would say. Uh, on the question about digital protectionism, I think as the digital economy grows, um, you'll see that happening. I mean, when you don't have, uh, when it's below the radar, uh, you know, governments don't take the time or they don't bother to regulate too much or to see that, for example, as a source of revenue, right? 
Now, as it begins to boom, as it begins to be the bigger portion, maybe soon, of what we do and what we buy and sell in the, in, in the real economy, I mean, those things are going to come up. It's inevitable that they're going to come up. Now, we have to make sure that they come up in a reasonable manner, in a manner that does not uh, impede uh, development, uh, growth, job creation, and, 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 and it will not stifle development and economic growth. How do we do that? I don't know. That's something that we need to talk about. This is what we're trying to talk about, particularly in terms of trade in the WTO. Um, as to your second question, frankly, I didn't hear it too well. I didn't understand. Uh, if you could repeat that. Yeah, yeah are, I mean, are we already seeing the digital world cleave into different spheres of influence? Uh, China uh, is oh. operating behind the Great Firewall. The EU has GDPR, which is something yeah, I think, is I think there will be entry. different. There will be different models, and there will be different concepts of doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, digital business, uh, and that's natural. That's okay. That's uh, what we have to do is to ensure that, that, that for the future, those different models, they don't conflict in a way that avoids cooperation, that uh, avoids um, synergies between the different models. And each one is going to figure out, you know, uh, that, or, or try to make that their models are the ones that prevail. That happens in every industry. Remember, the automobile industry is the same. You know, the bumper in one country has a particular specification that bumper... That's, that's the way the world is. I mean, that's, that's reality, I think. And as, as the digital economy continues to grow, you'll see more and more of that. We have two minutes before we wrap, and I was going to just go around with each of you one very brief question. And that is, we're reassembled next year, so one year from today. It's the same group, we're here, and with the same audience. What's the one change, the one wish that you have that you obtain <laughs> between now and next year? Well, I would say concrete, uh, substantive progress in the WTO reform. Okay. Trust. Trust. You have to bring trust. That's good. Right. We have to far better explain to the public the benefits of trade. Right. You certainly got that point across today, David. I would like to see uh, <clears throat> this e-commerce agreement through the WTO process, like the trade facilitation. It's just so important. The world is changing so much from an e-commerce standpoint. Getting that agreement, I think, would answer some of the questions about the WTO process. I just think it would prove very relevant. And Roberto? I want to see their wishes realized. <laughs> <laughs> Great ending. First, thank you. What a distinguished panel. Thank you so much. And thanks to the audience for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.